Hey guys, in this video we're going to look at questions from chapter 18 on chemical thermodynamics from practice exam 2.2 in the fall 22 semester. And this first one deals with entropy. We're asked to select all of the reactions or processes from the list below that correspond to a negative entropy change. So it helps here to remind ourselves what entropy is conceptually. And keep in mind that Entropy is equivalent to energy or matter dispersal. I'll just write the word dispersal here to remind ourselves of this. And more roughly speaking, entropy is a measure of disorder. And I'll go ahead and write that here just to remind us of that as well. So with a negative entropy change, we're looking for processes that decrease energy or matter dispersal or concentrate matter or energy or make things more ordered, less disordered less random. So let's keep that in mind as we navigate these processes. So first we have evaporation. Now evaporation can, corresponds to the conversion of a liquid where the molecules are relatively close together, moving relatively slowly into a gas where the particles are much farther apart, generally taking up a much larger volume and generally moving much more quickly. This corresponds to an increase in energy dispersal, matter dispersal, and so this is definitely a positive delta s in the first case. And so that one's out. We can go ahead and cross through it. In the second case, we've got a reaction that converts methane gas and oxygen gas into CO2 gas and water vapor. And here it's helpful to look at the numbers of moles of gas on the reactant and product side, reasoning that a reaction that has more moles of gas on the product side than the reactant side generally corresponds to a dispersal of matter and energy, right? For a similar reason to evaporation, we're creating gas where there was no gas before. In this particular case, we've got methane and O2, two moles of O2 on the left-hand side for a total of three moles of gas on the left-hand side, and CO2 at one mole and H2O at two moles on the product side for a total of three moles of gas on the product side. So here, with the change in number of moles of gas equal to zero, we would expect the entropy change to be roughly zero here. So not necessarily profoundly positive or negative. We're going to go ahead and leave that one unchecked. Now in the third case, we have aqueous NaCl separating into sodium cations and chloride anions. And here we have a single formula unit. In fact, let's represent that as a Na plus cation in blue and a Cl minus anion in red, separating into two distinct particles and Na plus cations surrounded by or hydrated by water molecules as the solvent, and a Cl minus ion, again, hydrated, surrounded by water molecules. So with the particles separated, this looks a lot like the first case, right? And it's actually, I think, helpful to think of aqueous solutes as kind of like gases in their own way, right? These are particles in a medium that can freely move that aren't really associated with each other just like gas particles in an ideal gas. And so here, again, this looks like a positive entropy situation where the products are more dispersed, more random than the reactants. All right, how about the third case? 2NH3 going to N2 plus 3H2, and everything's gaseous. So here again, we have a change in moles of gas situation. The change in moles of gas here is positive one. We're creating four moles of gas, one and two and three H2s, from uh, two moles of NH3. And so the delta N is actually two there, not, not one. But here again, with an increase in the moles of gas, similar to the cases above, we're looking at a positive delta S situation here rather than negative. So no negative delta Hs just yet. All right. Next case, we have three iron two cations combined with two phosphate anions to make Fe3PO42 solid. So in a sense, we have the reverse of the NaCl case here in a way, although we're going all the way to solid Fe3PO42. And so we're going from a situation where we have the ions dispersed in an aqueous solution to concentrated in a solid and part of an ionic lattice. This corresponds to a decrease in entropy, a concentration of matter and energy into generally a smaller volume. The solid will have 
often a smaller volume than the original solution. And so here indeed we found our first example of a negative entropy change process where the products are more ordered, we might say, or more concentrated or less dispersed than the reactants. CO2 gas to CO2 aqueous, well that's actually a similar situation to the one above. We're taking CO2 gas, which is generally widely dispersed over a very large volume, and concentrating it into a smaller volume in an aqueous solution. So the CO2 particles become less dispersed, less random, less disordered. This is a delta S less than zero situation. So we'll go ahead and check that. Now finally with freezing, freezing similar to condensation, the reverse of evaporation, takes a liquid where the particles are moving a little bit faster, are a little bit more randomly oriented, a little bit more dispersed. Quite often the volume of a liquid is larger than the volume of the corresponding solid. And we're concentrating that energy down, we're concentrating those partic particles down into a smaller volume. Generally they're moving more slowly and that sort of thing. And so this as well corresponds to a negative change in entropy. With the products, the solid product, a more ordered situation, more concentrated situation than the liquid reactant. In question nine, we're going to be applying the statistical definition of entropy. And quite often for these questions, there'll be sort of a, a highly contrived situation to simplify our thinking on this. It can be connected to the chemical world, although generally we won't do that so that we're thinking in terms of statistics and probability, which we're very familiar with from uh, everyday life in terms of games of chance and, and that sort of thing. So for example here, we're told we're using a seven-sided die in a game and we're thinking of each possible outcome of rolling all the dice we have as a microstate. And I'm actually going to underline the microstate in blue so that we can use colors here to think about this. Now, we want to know, okay, we're playing with six dice. We want to know how many microstates are possible. Now, what is this quantity? How many microstates are possible? Well, from the statistical definition of entropy, right, this quantity corresponds to W. You sometimes hear it called the likelihood of the corresponding macro state, that kind of thing. We're interested in figuring out the value of W for this game that we're playing. Now, if I've got a seven-sided die, there are seven possible outcomes, right? So let me just note here, we've got seven outcomes per die. We've got six dice. And so the total number of possible outcomes is those seven possibilities for each die raised to the sixth power. Because for the, the seven, the six dies rather are independent of each other. So for each possibility on die number one, there are seven possibilities on die number two, seven on die number three, seven on die number four, etc., etc. So the right approach here is to take this number of dice, let me underline that in red, that we're dealing with here, that's the exponent, and the number of possible outcomes, as we indicated here with a seven-sided die, appears here. So w is equal to seven to the sixth power, and we can simply plug and chug to find this number. It's going to be very large, and this is very typical of W values. So when we do the math here, seven to the sixth power, I get 117,649. So very large number of outcomes. And although we're not gonna do it here, keep in mind that we could calculate an entropy associated with an entirely random macro state where the value of uh, the, die, the dice we roll is completely random using Boltzmann's equation S equals K times the natural log of that W value. In this question, we're given the enthalpy change and the entropy change for the reaction so shown here of Fe2O3 with carbon monoxide to form iron metal and CO2. The delta H is negative. The reaction is exothermic. Let's go ahead and note that down. And the delta S is positive. We don't really have a word for that, but 
that's good from the perspective of spontaneity. In terms of the second law, when a process has a positive entropy change, this generally makes it spontaneous, particularly when the enthalpy is also enthalpy change is also negative. So in each of the items here, we have a prompt about the spontaneity of the reaction and its dependence on temperature. So notice this 1631.5 Kelvin, this is equal to the delta H value divided by the delta S value, the absolute value of that. And I won't go through this calculation, but it's worth verifying on your own that this is the result you get when you divide 24,800 joules by 15.2 joules per Kelvin. And that same value is, is given here. So we've got essentially four possibilities for the temperature dependence of spontaneity in this question. We've got the reaction is spontaneous only above the cutoff temperature. The reaction is spontaneous at all temperatures. The reaction is never spontaneous as written, no matter the temperature. The reaction is spontaneous only below the cutoff temperature. Now, a key concept here as well is this idea that the free energy change is delta H minus T delta S. And when this value is less than zero, we can conclude that the reaction is spontaneous. And the question is, when is delta G less than zero for this reaction? Well, delta H is negative, delta S is positive, and the temperature here, well, this is always in Kelvin, right? And so this number is always positive. This means that for this particular set of circumstances, with the reaction exothermic, so that's a negative value, and negative T delta S overall is a negative value because we have a positive value here and the temperature must be positive, delta G will always be negative regardless of the temperature, right? We can think about this graphically if we put the origin, for example, right here, and this is the delta G, and on the x-axis we have temperature, the free energy change at zero temperature, well, that is the enthalpy change, and that's below zero. That's negative. With delta S positive, the slope of this line will be negative, negative T delta S in the definition of delta G, and so we're living below that zero line regardless of the temperature. This reaction is spontaneous at all temperatures is essentially the conclusion we come to here. Regardless of the value of T, delta G will always and forever remain less than zero for this process.